I'm so worried about you because you're TSH. And they're like, never had a hypothyroid in my life. And then I look at their labs and there was no free T3. They didn't test to see, did the package get delivered? Because let me tell you something, I've lived without pretty much T4 in my body for seven, eight years. And there's people that have for decades. It's just the storage hormone. T4 is useless unless it converts to the thing that matters and that is free T3. So that's really the ultimate goal is making sure your free T3 status is right for you. Welcome to the Fundamental Health Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Paul Saladino. This podcast is the result of my relentless search to understand and correct the roots of chronic disease and illness. In this podcast, I will share with you everything I have learned about how to live the most healthy and radical life possible. Thanks for joining me on this journey. What's going on, everybody? My book is alive. It is alive and crushing. It is already an Amazon bestseller. It was in the top 20 books on Amazon for a couple of days. It's now continuing to do really well on Amazon, remains in the top 100 books on Amazon a week after it's been published. It has over 150 five-star reviews. Thank you so much to all of you for your support and for giving me your feedback on the book. You can find it. It is called The Carnivore Code. It is at thecarnivorecodebook.com, which will take you directly to the Amazon link. The ebook is out on Amazon. There's also an ebook on Nook, which is Barnes & Noble, and on iBooks, which is Apple's platform, as well as a print version on Amazon. The audiobook, as you all know, is coming in a few weeks. I recorded it in, in my voice, so it's in this voice that you are all so familiar with. So you'll hear me reading the whole book to you, lulling you into a state of nerdery, I suppose. I was going to say a state of sleep, but I don't think anybody's going to be sleeping reading my book, but it'll be soothing because it's amazing. So check out my book, you guys. Let me know what you think. Please leave me a review for the book on Amazon. Please leave me a review for this podcast on iTunes because this podcast continues to crush it. This is how we spread the good message. For those of you who don't know, my book is about the carnivore diet. It's about sort of my thesis around what the carnivore diet is, how to do it, why to even do this thing, plant toxins, our origins as humans, our brain size growth, all the plant toxins in detail, all the comparisons of animal foods versus plant foods in terms of nutrient availability, and then debunking so many of the myths around the carnivore diet or around meat. Meat will cause cancer. Meat will cause heart disease. Meat will cause your microbiome to get messed up. I debunk all those thoroughly. Then I give you a plan to do it all in detail. So check out my book. And then I also talk about regenerative agriculture, which is my baby. So check out my book and let me know what you guys think. Thecarnivorecodebook.com. There are so many exciting things in the works, you guys. I can't tell you about all of them, but so many exciting things are coming in the next few weeks. Look for the collaborations. They are coming. And look for the media spots. I got all kinds of exciting stuff happening. And this podcast is super exciting because my guest is Elle Russ, who's a good friend of mine. She wrote The Paleo Thyroid Solution. We dig into thyroid in detail on this one, you guys. I've never done a podcast exclusively on thyroid. The previous one I did with Jamie Seaman about hormones was super popular. Everybody's got a thyroid. Everybody's got hormones as well. Everybody's got either testicles or ovaries. We've all got hormonal glands, and it's very important that we understand how to assess the health of these and what to do if they're not healthy, how to know if the tests your doctor is doing are adequate, and maybe if your symptoms persist, what else you should be looking for. We break it down in detail. You guys are going to love Elle. She is amazing. You guys are also going to love Belcampo, which are my people in Northern California. I've been going to the restaurant in Santa Monica and loving it. I always get the ribeye. Last time I got the New York steak. It's fantastic. They are grass-fed, grass-finished in Northern California. They are regenerative agriculture. You guys listen to my podcast. You know these terms. It means it's carbon negative. It means the soil is getting enriched with organic matter. It means the cows are treated well during their life, and they are providing us with very high-quality organic meat that has never seen a grain or a grass seed in its life and is going to nourish us deeply. Their bone and ribeye is out of this world. You can use the code CARNIVOREMD at their website to get 20% off your order. Let me know what you think about Campo. They also have organs. They have liver. They have thymus. I love these guys. They are doing amazing things. If you are in San Francisco, they have a restaurant there. If you are in New York, they have a restaurant there. If you are in Los Angeles, they have multiple restaurants there. I hope I will all see you at Bel Campo very soon. The last time I went to dinner there, some of my fans were having dinner and they stopped me and it's all a little strange to be a mini sort of celebrity, which I'm not really, but I was happy to see them. And they were asking, when is the audiobook out? The audiobook is out in a few weeks, you guys. And I also love my people at White Oak Pastures, whiteoakpastures.com. These are really the, this is really the farm that I believe started this for me. They were the first farm that I learned about 
that is doing regenerative agriculture. They've been doing it for 20 years. Come to the farm in May, you guys, May 1st to 3rd. Come to White Oak Pastures, see what they're doing. You can check them out, whiteoakpastures.com. You can use the code CARNIVOREMD for 10% off your first order. It is amazing. And you can always go to info.whiteoakpastures.com front slash CARNIVOREMD for what is on special this week and use the code CARNIVORE15 for that. So sixth generation farm, 20 years in the family. Will Harris, Jenny Harris, the soil is rich and dark. It is increasing organic matter in the soil. They are sequestering carbon. It is carbon negative. The cows are healthy. They create healthy food for us. The whole thing works. The ecosystem works. The disruption of monocrop agriculture of by tilling of bee colonies of ecosystems is the scourge of our planet or one of the scourges. And supporting regenerative agriculture is so important for us. Check out these farms, you guys. I love them dearly. Whiteoakpastures.com, bellcampo.com. Use the code CARNIVOREMD at both of them and let me know what you think of their meat. And it is amazing. It is amazing. I also really love Ancestral Supplements. My people, Ancestral Supplements. Supplements.com. They are making all sorts of incredible nose to tail organ supplements from New Zealand grass fed, grass finished cattle, conveniently encapsulated into a pill, into a gelatin capsule. And for those of us that can't get to organs, that don't want to eat organs, that don't have access to organs, these are a fantastic opportunity to get these and organs that we would never get otherwise. For instance, in this podcast, we are talking about thyroid and we are talking about desiccated thyroid and natural formulations of thyroid that have both T4 and T3. Well, guess what? Ancestral Supplements sells a thyroid. And if you are thinking you might need a little bit of thyroid support, you can check out their thyroid. I would not use this in place of your medication unless you are talking to your physician, but the Ancestral Supplements thyroid is going to have bioactive T4 and T3 in it. It's prepared in much the same way as NP thyroid, but it's not standardized. It's going to be an amazing adjunct if you're looking for a little bit of help do it with your provider and, but check it out. And they also have other organs that are amazing. They have liver, spleen, pancreas, thymus, mofo. When we're talking about endocrine organs and we're talking about sex organs, we need to be thinking about the health of these. And mofo is interesting. It's a male optimization formula that has testicle, prostate, and I believe it has bone marrow and liver as well. My goodness, it is good for your nether regions, both men and women. Both men and women have testosterone. Both men and men and women need the nutrients to make testosterone. And maybe we'll get them to make an ovary supplement in the future. Who knows, you guys, or you girls. Anyway, check out ancestralsupplements.com. You can use the code SALADINOMD at their Shopify site. Um, ancestralsupplements.com, they are putting back in what the modern world has left out. They are helping us all eat nose to tail, which is huge. I appreciate them greatly and love them dearly. The last sponsor I want to tell you about this week is another cool one. It's Future. They make a program for your Apple Watch. So I really like using my Apple Watch because it helps me integrate my daily routine, helps me check my schedule, helps me see text messages, helps me see emails, other things. But Future allows you to have a personal trainer with you in your watch. It's pretty cool. So it pairs you one-on-one with one of their world-class trainers. They create a personalized workout plan tailored specifically to your schedule, routine, your goals, and your progress. And it's much cheaper than a trainer at a regular gym. The coach is going to check on you daily to keep you on track. They're going to send you texts, make adjustments to your routine, and they're going to follow your progress on the Apple Watch. It's fully integrated. If you don't have an Apple Watch, that's no problem. When you sign up, they will send you everything you need, including an Apple Watch. It's Again, it's much cheaper than a trainer, and and it'll keep you on track if you don't need someone standing there with you all the time, but you need some scheduling, you need some actual structure to your routine. I found it to be really cool. They let me try it out and it was interesting to talk to people to see the schedules they made and they were definitely really helpful. So you can sign up for Future Today at tryfuture.com slash saladinomd and get 50% off your first month. Tryfuture.com slash saladinomd for 50%. That's half off your first month. So check it out, tryfuture.com slash SaladinoMD. Let me know what you guys think of this one. It's a new app on the market. I thought it was really cool, and I'm excited to share it with you guys as well. So without further ado, on to the podcast with my good friend Al Russ, and listen after for what is going on with me. Three, two, one, go. We're live. Al Russ, thanks for coming on the podcast. Oh, I'm so happy to be here to talk to you about this. It's such a cool topic. We're going to talk all about thyroid and hormones. This is something that comes up all the time on ketogenic, low-carb diets, on carnivore diets. I've previously talked to Jamie Seaman about this, but we are going to do a deep dive about thyroid today. And I think a lot of people, both men and women, are going to love this because 
look, we've all got thyroids. Not everybody has ovaries uh, or testicles, but everybody has a thyroid. So both all of you guys and girls out there, this is relevant to you. So, and you've got your book. I see it there. For people who are watching on YouTube, you can see the book that Elle has, The Paleo Thyroid Solution. It's awesome. It's a great uh, appraisal of all the details we're going to talk about in this podcast if you guys want to go a little deeper. And as we talked about before we started recording the podcast, Elle has to write a second book because there's so much more to talk about. So, so let's just start with this. Your story is one of hypothyroidism, and this will set the stage. We're going to talk about a lot of terms. This podcast is probably going to get really technical at times, but I think your story will help frame all of our discussions around different thyroid hormones, how they're interconverted, different medications we might use, different thyroid preparations. Let's just start there. Yeah. So my story is that uh, I went to over, well, let's start with, I, my first symptom was I was 30 years old. And I had perfect gynecological health my whole life, perfect health my whole life, no issues. Suddenly I'm getting my period every week. And I'm like, what's going on? I chalked it up to being a fluke. It kept happening. First thing that I didn't know, and if I knew now, I would have checked the doctor, but basically they kept putting me on the birth control pill to try to band-aid the symptom of the bleeding. Right. No one said, what's, how, what's causing this, right? Of course, no one got to the root. We all know this, right? All right. So I kept going on these pills and then I kept bleeding through all of the pills and I was like, okay. And then meanwhile, my hair is falling out. I'm getting fatter and fatter. You can see I have perfect skin. I had acne all over my, it was just, everything was wrong. I gained massive weight. Now, Here's the thing. I was working out. Now, granted, I was working out in the wrong way then. I was doing some chronic cardio. I wasn't necessarily on a great food paradigm. It was probably low carb, low fat zone BS. Okay. But um, I, I'm 5'2". I'm, let's say I, at the time, maybe I was like 112, 115. I'm a tiny person. I got up to 160 and that was with working out two hours a day wow. and eating like 1200 or less calories. I could not, nothing that I did. Then fell into adrenal fatigue and then a whole host of symptoms. It led to me being misdiagnosed with polycystic ovarian syndrome. And I had a fibroid and a polyp in my uterus that had to be removed. Now someone's like, how could you be misdiagnosed with polycystic ovarian syndrome? Wow. What a dumb doctor. No, here's the thing. If you took the ultrasound as a gynecologist, I looked at it. It was the exactly the same profile as someone with PCOS, but no one said what caused it, what caused it. Had they just looked at my thyroid, which ultimately got fixed, I don't have PCOS. I've never really technically had it. I was in a disease state and hypothyroidism as a disease state, it's a domino effect, okay? So you get all of these other issues and then doctors are trying to do some patchwork like a, a damn quilt all over you and they're never getting to the root. Now you said um, earlier, you're like, everyone has a thyroid. Absolutely true. It is the master gland. We can't live without it. So if you don't have one right now because it's been surgically removed, don't be hanging out on stranded islands because you're going to die. You know, you will die pretty quickly without your medication. Um, so it's absolutely necessary. So if you're going to die without the actual gland, uh, or if you're born with that one, like one in a gajillion, right? Children are born without a thyroid gland. If you don't catch it right away, that kid is going to be have mental retardation almost immediately. In fact, I've only met a couple, I said one time in a podcast, if you're one of the billion people that was born without a thyroid, contact me. And I had a couple of people contact me and they're like, actually I was, but they caught it right away. And had they not, it would actually have caused mental retardation in that child. So you can't live without one. What do you think life's going to be like with subpar hormone, thyroid hormone levels? It's like dying slowly. And frankly, that's what it feels like, Paul, when you're riddled with it. Now, some people who catch it quick, oh, that's great, lucky them. But I suffered for two years and then had another second bout, a reverse T3 hypothyroidism. And so here I was, I'm, I'm going to all these doctors. I'm bleeding, I'm, I'm a mess. I can't find anything. There was no paleo primal then. It was 15 years ago. There weren't even really any podcasts. And the only people that saved me were fellow thyroid patients. And that's why the best-selling thyroid books are written by patients because we understand what it was like. And this woman dedicated her life to creating a forum where patients could talk to each other and they let they started to lead me in the right direction so that I could help myself. But ultimately, Paul, I had to go online, black market, buy my own thyroid hormone and dose myself back to health. That's unacceptable because I live in Los Angeles. Okay. I mean, I live in like the world of the best doctors. I went to celebrity hormone doctors. I went to everybody, you know, people wrote celebrities wrote books on hormones. I went to their doctors in Beverly Hills. Nobody seemed to fix it. And what they were doing is they were taking the wrong test. So my original doctor who kept putting me on the pill was like, your thyroid's fine. Tapped my gym shoes with his hand and said, just use these more. I'm like, dude, I'm working out two hours a day, bro. I'm swimming 30 laps. I'm hiking. I'm at the gym. Like granted that was overdoing it, but so that's what they, we get acute because of their faulty 40 year old outdated training and being uninformed. 
patients get stuck with, well, it must not be my thyroid. Then you're down this whole other path of looking at these things that are going wrong with you and thinking somehow you're going to treat it that way. You know what I mean? So, so my story is that I had to fix myself. I accidentally became an expert because nobody would help me. So twice in 10 years, I was on my own. And let me tell you something, Paul, I have a philosophy degree. Okay. This was like not a real fun situation for me to have to learn all this science stuff. But at the end of the day, I saved my own life. I shouldn't have to. So that's why I wrote this book because patients need to help themselves or help their doctors help them. And you have to get educated because 99% of the doctors out there aren't, and it's getting better. It's getting better with functional medicine. It's getting better with, you know, podcasts and information being out there on the internet, but it is still the bane of thyroid patients existence. I talk to people all over the world, Paul, the number one prescription in the U S is thyroid medication. 200 million people have it. 26 plus million Americans have it. And 60% are undiagnosed and reverse T3 problems are on the rise. We are seeing more and more of it with like functional medicine doctors that I speak to. So this is something that we have to fix. And it's so dumb because it's such a dumb fix. Really. When you look into it, it really is kind of simple in a lot of ways. And so that's the tragedy of it. It's just not that complicated. And there are so many parts of that story that I want to highlight. I want to assure the listener, we're going to dig into all that. We're going to talk about reverse T3. We're going to talk about different formulations. We're really going to dissect Elle's story and help you guys understand what went wrong and how it's all connected. The first thing I want to mention is that um, I, I, I want people who are listening, women, to know that using birth control to treat hormonal irregularities or menstrual irregularities is not a fix, Right. We cannot, this is fake. And this is what I talked to Jamie Seaman about too. This happens all the time. And I'm, I don't like to throw gynecologists under the bus, but I'm going to throw gynecologists under the bus a little bit here. If you are going to a gynecologist, I'm sure that that man or woman is very well-intentioned and very intelligent and has a great heart. But if they are giving you birth control pills because your period is irregular, they are putting a Band-Aid. That is not the problem. There is something else causing the menstrual irregularity. And so it's so frustrating for me to hear your story. You had menstrual irregularities. And they're just like, take more birth control. We can make it look good. We can cover this up. This is what Western medicine does. And again, as I've said, it's not because doctors are bad people. It's because we're not trained properly and we're not thinking about it as an interconnected system as we need to. The other thing that I love you, that you highlighted was that you were diagnosed with PCOS. You were diagnosed with polycystic ovarian syndrome. And we'll get into this. It's a condition that's associated with insulin resistance. And as we'll talk about, because of your thyroid abnormalities, you developed insulin resistance. And <clears throat> so this is a great case. This is actually kind of a complex case where your PCOS was due to insulin resistance and, <clears throat> and that insulin resistance came from your thyroid. And again, when people have PCOS, what do they get? They get birth control. They get birth control. Uh, generally or speaking. metformin, right? right? Right, or metformin. And again, you have to pull it back and think, what is the root cause here? What is going on? And again, it's so hard for traditionally trained physicians like myself to see, the, to see the network here, to see the nodes, to see the interconnectedness because we are taught to think about things in terms of organ systems. And this came up when I was on the doctor's TV show. They were trying to say that because I was trained in brain stuff as a psychiatrist uh, in a psychiatry residency, I had no ability to treat nutritional problems. I had, no, uh, I had no authority. I had no expertise. And I thought, okay, first of all, the separation of humans into organ systems doesn't serve the patient. This is exactly what happened to you. They were saying, your uterus is broken. Here's some medication for your uterus, you know? And it's like, what the hell? Or your ovaries are broken. They're polycystic. Here's medication for that. It drives me nuts. And the other, the last piece of this that I want to highlight is that crowdsourcing of information makes us all so smart. Look, doctors are not the smartest people when it comes to health and medicine anymore. It's you and 7,000 other people on a thyroid forum because that collective consciousness, that collective information is better than any doctor on the freaking planet. And that's what you experience. And so I, I think that People in the health space, I mean, I'm a physician, hopefully can add to the discussion. Uh, we're formally trained, but we are not the only source of good information people out there. It, perhaps we can provide podcasts and things like this, but um, it's, it, there's so many amazing pieces of that story. So let's dig into that a little more. Like, as you started to unravel this, what did you find out? What was helpful and what went wrong? Well, you know, what I found out and <laughs> was that basically the doctors were taking a 1973 blood test for thyroid 
completely outdated paradigm on how to gauge thyroid hormones. So basically they were like, your thyroid's fine. We tested it. So, you know, this is almost like gaslighting at this point because, you know, you're going everywhere like, well, what's wrong with me then? And, and it sends you down this path where, you know, I suffered for two years and things got worse. Boy, would I love to give the invoice for the polyp uterine surgery I had to have to the first doctor who kept putting me on all the pills. And by the way, regarding the birth control pill, as you probably know, it robs you of your thyroid and testosterone. So thanks very much for that. I mean, I've been on the pill before and look, that could have done it. I was on the pill for like 10 years before this happened. That's possible. We don't know why it happened. There's lots of things that contribute to this. I did eventually discover down the road, I had a selenium deficiency, I had a CoQ10 deficiency. Uh, listen, I, I, I'm a swimmer. I swam in chlorine a lot. Could that have affected it? I mean, look, was it my diet and lifestyle and insulin resistant and a, a crappy diet? Sure. There's a million factors that could have affected it. The problem is, is that I was just trying to get better. I couldn't find it. And I don't know if this will help if we want to get into details right now off the bat, but I'm happy to explain like how the thyroid works and the actual hormones so that we went in moving forward. What I did find is this, and I'll go into a discussion about the thyroid in a minute if you'd like, but at the end of the day, the only biologically active thyroid hormone is T3, okay? That's just the bottom line. T4 is a storage hormone, nothing wrong with that. It's supposed to be there. And there's so many great reasons as to why this thyroid feedback loops works the way it does. And so if you don't mind, I'd love to describe that or, okay. So, so here's the thing. So it's going to sound strange to some people listening and you can always re-listen to this because I'm going to be talking about T4, T3, reverse T3 and TSH. And it's like, oh God, great. This is like Chinese and math, you know? So I get it. But if you, if you look at it logically, it makes a lot of sense and you just have to kind of forget that there's no, you know, terms involved. So basically here's what happens. The pituitary at the base of the brain is kind of like you can see it as a sensor or a signal. And when it senses that your body is low in this important biologically active thyroid hormone T3, it will send a signal, like a wake up call to the thyroid gland, which is at the base of the neck. If you're a man, it's below your Adam's apple. And it, um, it's a butterfly shaped gland. And basically here's the thing, it is responsible for the production and regulation of all of our sex hormones, our heart rate, our body temperature, it is our thermostat. So when it's low and you're hypothyroid, you're often freezing you're sluggish, you have constipation, everything's sluggish and slow and your body kind of breaks down. And then it's like accelerated glycation and insulin resistance. And it's a, it's a bad disease soup of a body. If you swing the other way and you go hyperthyroid, that's almost a more immediately dangerous. People can have a heart attack. It's Goldilocks. We don't want too much. We don't want too little. And this whole feedback loop is genius and brilliant in its design because really at the end of the day, the whole thing is trying to save your life. And I'll explain that in a minute. So the, 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 the pituitary sends a signal to the thyroid like, hey, hey, time to wake up, produce more hormones. Now, that signal is called TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone. It is not a thyroid hormone. It is a pituitary hormone signal. And this is the test in 1973 that all of the doctors will test a patient with and they'll just test the TSH and they will gauge a person's status based on that. I'm going to explain why that is absolutely faulty doctoring. <laughs> um, so the TSH is just a signal. At any given time, like Paul, you could be fasting in the morning, go for a workout, come back. And at that time, the signal might be pretty strong. Like let's say on a scale of zero to five, maybe that signal is like 3.5 at that time. Well, some doctor who's just TSH focused is going to go, oh my God, Paul, I'm worried about you. And they might even prescribe you medication based on that. But here's why that's wrong. This is just the wake up call to the thyroid. When the wake-up call is sent, if everything is working correctly, this is what your own thyroid does. It produces a lot of something called T4 and a little bit of something called T3. What do they both mean? T3 is really the only biologically active hormone. This is what we want. That's the package. That's the fire. That's the metabolism. To elaborate that, if you, back in the day, not now anymore, since my book and everything else, but if you typed in T3, about a thousand bodybuilding websites would come up because bodybuilders actually abuse T3 when they're trying to shed as much fat as humanly possible before a competition. Okay. So that tells you about the fat burning effects of T3. It's dangerous. They have to offset the catabolic nature of too much T3 and do a whole bunch of other efforts with their system and it's a totally bad situation no one should do it but it just goes to show you this is why it's so important that's why hypothyroid patients get fat often okay so we've got t3 is the actual package that's what we need but this thing is like a it's like an atomic bomb of energy right it's it increases your heart rate it's sex hormones your temperature so t4 is the storage 
hormone. And it basically, your thyroid releases more of that, 80 to 90%, we don't totally know, maybe 9 to 20% of T3. So the, the thyroid, when it's working right, signal sent, yo, 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 wake up. Then the thyroid goes, okay, great, we're going to produce a ton of T4 and a little direct T3. And then throughout the day, as L needs it, we're going to convert the storage hormone into this powerfully metabolically active T3. What is not used, what is not converted, what L does not need, we will flush out through a system called reverse T3. Reverse T3 is the inactive form of T3. Those are the four basics. Thyroid signal sent TSH, thyroid responds with pumping out mostly T4, the storage hormone, and a little T3 throughout the day as you need it. The T4 will convert into the T3 and whatever's not will be flushed out naturally through the system called reverse T3. Why does it do that? Why wouldn't our thyroids just blast off T3? You know, and, and the reason for that is, and this is why it's such an elegant feedback loop, just as you know, like even with type 2 diabetes, your body's always trying to save you at any given time. The reason that reverse T3 is there is to save you as well, because it's like your body's emergency break. You don't want to, let's say, for example, um, I'm, I'm a normal working thyroid, everything's great, but now I get into a terrible car accident and my leg is severed and there's all sorts of problems going on in my body, or I have a horrible fever from the flu, something like that, the body is going to go, whoa, 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 let's dial this back a bit. She's in danger. Let's, 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 convert, let's convert more of that T4 into the reverse T3 because this is like throwing fire into fire. Or it could be another situation where, again, there's lots of reasons why the T4 won't convert into the T3, but essentially that system is there as an emergency break, the reverse T3. Now, some patients have problems with converting T4 to T3. I do. You can have an overproduction of it flushing to the reverse T3, which is a reverse T3 problem, which is what I had, and we can get into more of that later. But essentially, this elegant feedback loop is there. There's lots of problems that can come in and jack it up. However, it's really elegant. But here's the thing. All that matters at the end of the day is that you get the right amounts of T3. So, so what doctors are testing the TSH all the time it's like, call, it's like you order something from Amazon and you don't get it. Do you keep ordering it? No. You call up and you check on the damn shipping. You know what I'm saying? Like, where is this stuff? The package is T3. Did you get it or not? So the main tests, and I'll just say them here. They're in my book, my free thyroid guide, but TSH, free T3, free T4, reverse T3, and then the two Hashimoto's thyroid antibodies, TPOAB and TGAB. Now, I don't have Hashimoto's. We can talk about that. It's still a form of hypothyroidism. It's just autoimmune inspired. However, at the end of the day, this feedback loop, it's important to assess every element of it. So for years, this is what would happen. Some endocrinologists would just continually test their patients for TSH and T4. But they're not saying, is the thing converting into the thing that matters? So what really corresponds with how a patient feels or how you feel is where is your free T3 level at? And what does free mean? It means free, unbound, and available. So people might take total T3, and you could look at other different thyroid tests. There's, there's, there's so many more than I just mentioned, but those are the basics to really find out, is something wrong here? Okay, so for years, doctors were just testing the signal. In fact, Mark Sisson, who we all know fit, have never had a hypothyroid symptom in his life, his doctor even at one point tested his TSH. He goes, oh my God, Mark, I'm worried about you. Same thing with Brad Kearns. I'm so worried about you because you're TSH. And they're like, never had a hypothyroid symptom in my life. And then I look at their labs and there was no free T3. They didn't test to see, did the package get delivered? Because let me tell you something, I've lived without pretty much T4 in my body for seven, eight years. And there's people that have for decades. It's just the storage hormone. T4 is useless unless it converts to the thing that matters. And that is free T3. So that's really the ultimate goal is making sure your free T3 status is right for you. And I hope that that description all made sense. And if it didn't, tell me what I need to clarify. That's amazing. And I, I so appreciate you laying that out for people. Um, and I just want to um, give you an electronic high five and say thank you for being the only guest on my podcast that talks as fast as me, because it, <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. I love it. There's all tons of information. There's tons of zeal coming at you guys from L. Russ, and that is amazing. Um, uh, I think that very few people can, can hold the candle to your, uh, to, your, to your zeal, your fervor, and the speed with which you're talking, which is fantastic. You guys, I'm sure, can get it all. So I love it. 
this. This is what L is talking about. This is TSH coming from the anterior pituitary, goes to the thyroid, T4. T4 gets converted to T3. There are deiodinase enzymes, which remove uh, iodine atoms. So the thyroid um, is making T4 and T3 by putting iodine atoms. Iodine is a molecule. Uh, iodine is an atom. We're going to talk about it. It's, uh, and we're going to talk about that because there are toxins in our environment that can compete uh, with iodine for uptake in the thyroid that can affect the formation of our thyroid hormones. But iodine gets put onto uh, a molecule, uh, which becomes T4. You lose an iodine, it becomes T3. And that conversion is very important in the periphery with deiodinase enzymes. And then there, there's a certain deiodinase, like you said, shifts T4 over to reverse T3. And I want to also highlight for people that in situations of starvation, which you kind of mentioned, or chronic disease, Reverse T3 goes up. So let me, let me interject yeah. on that one. So this is a great example because this doesn't have to be, okay, so you thyroid six syndrome, right? If someone's like over dieting, which by the way, I probably was at the time because I was on the wrong eating paradigm and over exercising. So I'm sure I was not nourished and my body was like, this chick is starving or running from danger. But here's the thing. Let's say you're training for a marathon and you're on the wrong training slash, you know, uh, dietary paradigm that could send the message to the system oh my God, she's starving. She's in danger. She already has low body fat. Let's dial this back. We're going we're gonna to prevent this T4 from converting into this T3 until we send she's out of danger. Furthermore, we're not going to allow her to get pregnant. I mean, you, and I know I'm personifying like the human body and the thyroid, but again, our bodies are always trying to save us because it wants to continue on, right? And survive and prevail. So it makes sense. And that's why women are often affected gynecologically. You know what I mean? First, like they'll notice something there or miscarriages or infertility. And this is why there's some signal. We don't know what it is. Maybe it's overexercising or starvation or heavy metals or, you know, there's a million ways, things that can come in, toxins and can affect this loop which is why everybody should strive to keep a healthy thyroid because you don't want anything to go wrong. But at the end of the day, I mean, these threats could be diet and lifestyle that are sending a starvation message or a stress message where the body's like, she's in danger. You know, she's in danger. It could be staying up all night studying for medical exams or not getting a bunch of sleep or going through stressful divorce. I mean, any of this kind of fight or flight stuff that's continual and out of control is something that this whole feedback loop would go, we're going to try to protect her. We don't want to throw more fire onto this gasoline fire, right? We don't want to make her burn more fat when she's already low body fat and running 40 miles a week and eating low carb and low fat, right? You know what I mean? So, so again, it's a really elegant feedback loop, but we have to work with it. And that matters in how we think, how we act. And this is why, you know, living an ancestral paradigm, whether it's carnivore or paleo or whatever it is, and carnivore has been actually very helpful for a couple of clients that I know who have thyroid issues. So whether it's carnivore, of our paleo, but again, like the clean version of a high fat, moderate protein, low carb situation is really ideal. And the reason that's connected is this. So when I wrote the paleo thyroid solution, a lot of people were like, oh, I get it. So you gain the weight from being hypothyroid and then you go paleo to lose the weight. Uh, yes and no. The major reason why I made this connection and no one else had at the time is this is what the light bulb went off when I realized this, which was High fat, low carb, moderate protein is really the ultimate in glucose management and adrenal management. And those things go really hand in hand with this whole feedback loop. So it, that's what's really important about it. So you can actually be on thyroid hormone, maybe you're taking it every day and maybe you're doing well, but you might run into a problem with it if you're still on this same diet and lifestyle paradigm that you've been doing that's whacked. That's from, you know, 15 years ago. And, and, so, and so the same goes for... Um, Again, like any kind of lifestyle or over exercising and things like that. So it's just, it's really, it's a fascinating system, but it's what everybody should strive to protect and make sure that they are, that the metabolism of our thyroid hormones, the production of them, it's one thing to produce them. Like, you know, the, the TSH can send the signal and the body produce them, but are they going to get to where they need to go? That's really the most important part of this program. And so <clears throat> a lot of what we do and think and act in life can prevent those things getting to where they need to go. And I, I love this. Uh, I think we keep highlighting the fact that the thyroid is connected to everything. And really everything in our body is connected to everything. But if you are seeing a gynecologist or uh, a male replacement hormone physician or a psychiatrist or anyone, and they are not checking your thyroid, they are missing out, right? And so this is what's crazy for me. Um, uh, your psychiatrist should be checking your thyroid hormone. Your gynecologist should be checking your thyroid hormone. And, and if they are not checking TSH, free T4, 
free T3, reverse T3, and the two antibodies I'll mentioned, anti-thyroid thyroid peroxidase antibody and anti-thyroid globulin antibodies, then there's, there's pieces of that equation that are missing, and that's how we construct it. And so if someone is just checking your estrogen and your progesterone or your, your, your testosterone and your free testosterone and your prolactin, and they're not checking thyroid hormones, we, we can't even complete the picture. And this is the way that I think about this. Every specialist, every doctor should be checking thyroid hormones, which again, destroys the notion of specialties because every doctor, your cardiologist should be checking your thyroid hormone. Uh, just like your cardiologist should be checking your fasting insulin. I think every doctor should be checking fasting insulin, thyroid. You guys can all refer back to the blood work podcast I did. The labs that I talk about on that podcast should be checked by every physician you see because they're all connected. So- you know, I wanted to, I'm so glad you brought up psychiatry. So here's the thing, what we didn't talk about, and I, I have over 30 to 40 symptoms that I experienced in the book. I'll name a few. Aside from horrific weight gain, hair falling out, acne, um, you know, all of the gynecological issues, horrible constipation, laxatives wouldn't even fix. I had skin thickening, my eczema, not sure how you pronounce that one. Myxedema. Uh, myxedema. Yeah. yeah, there you go. It's a tough <laughs> one. So I had skin thickening. It's a horrible, disgusting thing where literally your skin's thickening and, and you can't pinch a little bit of skin on your body. And it feels like every time you bend your leg, you drink a bottle of MSG, um, inner itching of the ears, um, uh, heavy legs and restless legs were sometimes are related to low ferritin, which thyroid patients often get low in nutrients because we can't hold on to them. But here's the thing, depression and cognitive issues. So I'm a fast speaker. I'm articulate. I'm bound to jumble up a word every now and then, but Paul, when I was, or if I were to go off thyroid hormone right now and become hypothyroid again, I was almost dyslexic in my mind and speak. I couldn't find the words. I was saying them backwards. You'd read a paragraph. You can't retain it. You're so depressed. It's almost a general level of malaise and you slip slowly into it. So here's the thing. You go to the psychiatrist and they give you Prozac. It's not going to last after three months. And I talked to a head of major hospital in Los Angeles who's head of psychiatry and I go, are you testing your your patients for thyroid and eliminating that before you put them on medication? He's not. They're not doing it. Or if they are, they're just testing the TSH. Nobody should go on a statin blood pressure medication or diabetes medication or any of this stuff until the thyroid is absolutely assessed. It, we have more T3 receptors in our brain than anywhere else. Listen, I'm telling you, the brain stuff is not a joke. And here's the thing that's really sneaky about it. If you're listening, when I say this, sometimes people are like, oh my God, which is depending on your age, you feel like, am I getting dumb? Am I, am I, am I, and that's a hard thing to express to people, Paul. That's a weird thing to just share with a friend. It's one thing you're like, I've been gaining weight lately. Everybody's okay with sharing that. But it's another when you're like, uh, I think I'm getting dumb or I, I like I'm losing some cognitive abilities. Um, this is a scary thing. And then you might think, oh, well, you know what? Uh, Aunt Mary, she, she lost it. Maybe I'm going down. Well, maybe Aunt Mary had untreated Hashimoto's. Okay. Let's not, let's not project ourselves to that, but it is horribly depressing. The level of depression, and by the way, it's brain fog. How do I explain brain fog? Everybody's had a cold in their life where they're stuffy, da, da, da. Brain fog feels exactly like that, except for the stuffiness, in the sense that you're staring into space, you can't think, nothing seems fun, you don't want to watch a movie, you don't want to read, just you're just like dead brain. And people can get into car accidents. I mean, we have brain fog. You are not thinking right. Hand to dexterity, Paul, I am an athlete, okay? Like I would be knocking over stuff all the time when I was hypothyroid, tripping, really uncoordinated, hand to dexterity, messy handwriting. It's unbelievable the brain connection here. So yes, every doctor, no matter what it is, cardiologist, so, so high blood pressures, you know, is often insulin resistance. When you have low levels of T3, you have low levels of metabolism. You are are not burning fat and processing fat like you should. So therefore your lipid panel is going to look really messed up to a doctor. Um, and mine did too. They were like, Hey, you got to watch it. I was like, yeah, solve my thyroid problem. Everything's fine. Same with, you know, blood pressure and all these other things. Heart. Again, everybody should be looking at this. Unfortunately, those doctors are just testing the TSH. I can't tell you, this is the story of everyone's life where they're like, well, I checked my thyroid. It's not that my doctor said it's fine. Really? How do you know? Do you know? Cause you don't. Check it. I don't believe when anyone says that to me, I'm like, let me see the blood work. I bet you someone made a mistake there because it often is the case that those people who are told that it was fine, it wasn't. So the psychiatric stuff is really scary because you start to lose. It almost makes me want to cry for my old self, but 
you start to get a general malaise where you start to lose interest in not only taking care of yourself, you don't have the energy, your adrenals are shot now. When you don't have enough T3, then the adrenals over respond because they're like, we need to get her out of bed. We need to give her energy. It almost induces eating disorders based on the blood glucose dysregulation. So you become like obsessed with food. And then that leads into like, oh my God, I, I have an eating disorder. I'm like, I almost at one point wanted to go to Overeaters Anonymous. I thought something was wrong with me. Um, so hypothyroidism begets so many other problems. That's why it's called the master gland. I'm not calling it the master gland because I want to make it important. It is so important. So yes, psychiatrists, no matter what, everybody, you got anything wrong with you, test that thyroid. Because even Hashimoto's antibodies can lead to random allergies and weird things in a person where if they get it corrected, they're then not allergic to those things. So again, you could be treated with allergy shots. Again, this Band-Aid operation, this patchwork operation people are doing is just really what keeps people sick, you know? And there's people that have suffered. I know someone for 20 years went to Mayo clinics, traveled over the country, spent at least $200,000 trying to figure out what's wrong. Um, it was my best friend's mother. And I didn't know until like 20 or 30 years later, he was like, oh yeah, my mom's on Synthroid, which is a T4 only medication. And we could talk about why that fails people. And I said, oh my God, I had no idea all these years. I looked at her antibody results, her Hashimoto, she had double Hashimoto's. They were out of control, like 6,000, like 600 on one and, you know, like way high on the other. And I'm like, oh my God, no one at all these clinics, $200,000. And no one said, aha, let's start here. Let's start with the neck. Let's start with the thyroid. You always got to start there. So I'm glad you brought up psychiatry. And if you're out there and you're feeling a lack of lust for life and general malaise and depression, get your thyroid tested first because the Prozac ain't going to work after a while anyway, and you can turn it around naturally. People are treated with depression with something I take every day to live, T3. Absolutely. We do, we do use T3 sometimes for people with psychiatric illness. And I just love that it keeps highlighting the fact that in order to be a physician, you have to know all of medicine and uh, it's not okay for physicians to, to silo themselves and say, I'm just going to stay here in the heart. When I was a PA, they said, stay here in the heart. And I said, what are you talking about? When I was in you know, psychiatry residency, they said, stay here in the brain. I said, you guys are full of it. That's why I'm doing my own thing. So let's, let's, let's further, let's move the needle or let's move, let's fast forward. Let's, what, what was the rest of your story? What happened? And that'll lead us into more detailed discussions of all this kind of stuff. Sure. So what happened was I finally realized after going to two dozen, you know, like endocrinologists and doctors. Did you really go all, to 24? Uh, actually, I went to over 50 in 10 years um, oh and, and, and not, not necessarily visited them, but I actually emailed some or called some to ask them like, hey, and then they would give me the answer that I knew they were the wrong doctor and I wouldn't go to. But I probably in person went to at least two dozen, if not wow. more wow. doctors, wrote letters to others because I realized that I was wasting my money and my copay and my time going to a doctor only to find out that they were uninformed. So then after that, I started to like call their office, talk to their you know, nurse practitioners, ask them some questions. And those questions would let me know that they didn't know what they were talking about and I wouldn't waste my time. Yeah. So um, I had doctors telling me that I would kill myself uh, with taking the thyroid hormone that I did. So when I first realized, so I, I talked with fellow patients online and I was like, all right. And I realized that the answer at that time for me was natural desiccated thyroid. Natural desiccated thyroid is basically chopped up pig thyroid gland. And it is sort of in the ratios of what we talked about earlier. It's a lot of T4 and a little bit of T3. And there's other elements in there. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, let's go back in history for a second. So one of the problems, uh, T4, which is called Synthroid, there are several ways to treat hypothyroidism. The classic endric Kinologist Nazi way is to treat it with just T4. But anyone listening knows that we just described that your thyroid doesn't just pump out T4, it also pumps out T3. So giving a patient T4 only while it can work can sometimes fail people in the end because it's not actual endocrine mimicry to begin with. And let me explain how this cluster happened. Because back in the late 1800s, this English physician was a genius and he, people had big goiters, meaning like enlarged thyroids, like, you know, basketballs on their neck. Big and neck. he was like, what's up? Yeah. And he, he extracted sheep uh, thyroid gland, injected it to people, and it worked. Thus, thus natural desiccated thyroid became the one-stop, like, first treatment for thyroid patients. But in the 1950s, drug companies could not patent that. So they came up with T4 only and then started propaganda against natural desiccated thyroid. And then all the endocrinologists got on the bandwagon. And the story was T4 only, this Synthroid is the only way and the first and only way to treat thyroid patients. So a lot of patients went off NDT, which we call natural desiccated thyroid, and 
they got sicker and worse. And, and, and then now in the past 20 years or 15, 20 years, natural desiccated thyroid has made a resurgence because T4 only has failed so many people. Um, now, it can work for some people. But again, most doctors that prescribe T4 only, only test TSH and T4. So this one of the success stories in my book that had two miscarriages and all these issues, she was on, we looked at 10 years of her labs with a very famous endocrinologist in LA. He only tested TSH and T4. Again, he didn't test. Is the T4 that I'm giving her converting into the thing that actually matters? And he never did. And she had two miscarriages in 10 years. And then she came to him and she's like, hey man, I'm gaining all this weight, but I'm training for a marathon. And he's like, yeah, kind of blamed her of having a closet eating disorder, which a lot of doctors do, by the way. So many patients, when they hear that go, oh my God, that happened to me. Because the, and so that's really awful because you know, you're doing all that you can and you're gaining weight regardless. And even you're working out and it doesn't matter. You could eat a grape every day and you would gain weight with hypothyroidism, depending on how severe it is. So, so anyway, so I realized that like, so back in the day, that's what happened. So then T4 got like the best name and everyone started to use it. Then it started to fail people. So, you know, patients got out there, people wrote books, people were like, hold on a minute. Functional doctors got on the program and they went back to natural desiccated thyroid, which seemed to really work because it is T4 and T3. It is more endocrine mimicry. Now there is a another version of that called compounded T4, T3, which just means they're removing some of the fillers and things from the pig gland because you can't really divvy it up when you're using the desiccated thyroid gland. So sometimes if people are allergic or sensitive to fillers or they need to adjust it to the microgram, um, there are patients that can feel the difference between two or three micrograms. So in that case, you have compounded thyroid, which is basically T4 and T3. Then the last resort choice, which nobody should do unless they've exhausted all resources on this, is what I take called T3 only. So I take directly, I bypass this whole feedback loop. And there are, by the way, problems with that too, that this is not an easy game to play when you're on T3 only. T3 only. And again, the reason this is such an elegant feedback loop, T3 is very powerful and direct. <clears throat> it peaks in two hours and kind of dissipates in four. That doesn't mean you fall off a cliff after four hours, but it's quick and fast acting. T4 is very steady, right? It's there for you. It builds up and then it converts as needed. That is more metabolically safe, okay? So if you didn't have a thyroid gland and you had to be on thyroid hormone replacement and you were on T3 only, your doctor would be very worried if you got stranded on an island or you got into a car accident, were in a coma, and nobody knew what you were on because that could really affect your life. So doctors are very afraid of direct T3 because they've been taught all these years that T4 is the most important thing and it's steady and reliable. T3 is also reliable too. It just has to be dosed differently and conservatively and can change and have more fluctuations. So I will feel the fluctuations of weather, exercise, food, and I have become very intuitive over time about how I dose my T3, but it's kind of a pain in the butt. You, When you're on T3 only, you often have to dose two to three times a day. There is such a thing called slow release T3, and sometimes that is not the most optimal, and I can get into why that's not the most optimal for patients. It does work for a lot of people. So again, we have T4 only, mm, not usually the best choice, often fails people, endocrinologist, absolute synthroid T4 only Nazis. Then we've got ND natural desiccated thyroid, kind of one of the best, most natural, awesome options out there, very cheap and around for a hundred years. Then we've got compounded T4, T3, also not very expensive, but you need a doctor who understands compounding uh, thyroid. And, and it's usually compounded in the exact ratios as NDT. And then you've got T3 only. So those are the four treatments. How do you determine now? So this is why reverse T3 is important. If your doctor isn't testing reverse T3, how do they know T4 is an option? And let me explain this. T4 is the only thing that converts into the reverse T3, the inactive form, okay? It's the only thing. That's why I have to take T3 only because I don't worry about conversion anymore. And my T3 that I take every day does not convert into reverse T3. Thank God for that, Paul, because I don't know, I might be dead by now if, that, if T3 only weren't an option. So if your doctor's not testing your reverse T3 along with your free T3, they're not only not seeing if the T4 is converting into the thing that matters, but they're also not looking to see, is there a conversion issue? Because if you have a reverse T3 problem and people keep giving you more of the thing that doesn't convert, 
If people keep giving you more T4 and the T4 is only converting into the inactive, what happens is you remain hypothyroid even though you're on thyroid hormones. It actually almost sometimes feels worse, I've had a reverse T3 problem, than original hypothyroidism. It's almost like hypothyroidism plus. And here's how I like to explain it. And this is just a metaphor. So, um, you know, people are like, that's not exactly what happens, but let me just explain it. So you can imagine having a reverse T3 problem, whatever ignites it, like the reverse T3 is sort of standing in front of the T cells and blocking it, T3 cells and blocking it from entering. And that T3 is just sort of kind of, it's like you're driving around the parking lot at work, but you never punch in. Okay, so that's what happens. And if you don't test the reverse T3 to see what's going on there, you can really hurt a patient and make them worse. And this happened to me when I had discovered, so I fixed myself initially with natural desiccated thyroid. I was doing well for several years. And then all of a sudden I got hypothyroid symptoms again, but I didn't really think, I'm like, well, I'm on thyroid hormone. It can't be that, but I got these horrific hypothyroid symptoms. And it turns out I had a horrible reverse T3 problem. The NDT had backfired on me. The T4 had backfired and it's started to over convert into the inactive form. Meanwhile, my labs might have looked somewhat decent. I might have had a higher free T3, but I was suffering because again, it's like they were swimming around or we call it pooling sometimes. And again, these are metaphors we can't actually test and look at inside the cell, <laughs> see what like what's happening with the T3. So that's sort of how I like to describe it. So, um, and the only way to get out of that sometimes, if you don't do detox, fast, heavy metals, there's lots of things to clean up conversion problems, but I did all of that and nothing worked. So the only then last resort at that point is to go on the thyroid hormone T3 only that does not have reverse T3 in its mix. And I hope that made sense. And if not, tell me what I need to maybe clarify or add to that. No, that's great. Let's dig into that a little further. So let's go one level further and talk about this conversion between T4 and T3. And then let's talk about why people might be shunting T4 into reverse T3. So there's a conversion. So we talked about this with the diiodinases. We're pulling an iodine off of T4 to make T3. And that process is selenium dependent. You kind of hinted at this earlier that you had a selenium deficiency. So if people are not converting T4 to T3, it can be a selenium deficiency, right? So where do we get selenium from? Well, I mean, you can get it from some plant foods, but I think you're going to be much better off getting it from animal foods because oxalate and phytic acid can cause selenium and many of the minerals in plant foods to not be absorbed. And there can be selenium deficient soils. So that's one reason the T4 might not convert to T3. In your case, do you have a good sense of why you don't convert T4 to T3 well, or do you just think that you're shunting everything to T reverse T3? Well, I, I had taken enough selenium at some point to maybe that that wouldn't be the issue. Right. I don't know if I've got a genetic mutation on the D1 and D2 of conversion. I did have heavy metals, okay? Right. Now, I did detox from them, and since detoxing, I did try to get off thyroid hormone, and it didn't work. Um, or I would say this, it's not that it didn't work, it's that the reverse T3 kept creeping up. Um, Where I'm do you not, think your heavy metals were coming from? Uh, you know what could have been just a lifetime of sushi and tuna fish? <laughs> You Careful know, with just... this, guys. Careful with this. I was just on a podcast yesterday with The Minimalist, and <clears throat> pescatarianism is dangerous, in my opinion. You cannot eat tuna every day. You cannot even eat salmon every day, in my opinion, you guys. Like, this is, anyway, I had to add that. Like, no, I, my doctor would even say, like, hey, fish are our friends in a way. Like, he's, he eats meat, but he's, you know, you, you use it sparingly, you know? Um, something just changed with the microphone. Can you hear me? Something yeah, you're good. Okay, yeah. good. Um, all right, so yeah, lifetime of that. But then hold on, think about this. So then you get into a hypothyroid state, whether that caused it or not, okay? I also had silver fillings in my mouth. Most of them had been removed, but there was one in the back that I was not aware was still there. So every time I'm chewing, okay. So Mercury amalgams, yep. I had to get that removed and I did a natural collation process. And this is all I can say about heavy metals, which is I can't totally qualify it other than it did feel different after I went through natural collation and lots of saunaing in six months and not eating any fish and really cleared it up. I, I can't even almost qualify it, which I can kind of qualify everything, but I will say it definitely, I felt like, oh yeah, something's better here. So that could have caused it. But here's the thing, when you're in a disease state of subpar or like full on hypothyroidism or just like, you know, kind of low grade, you're not detoxing. Okay. And I also had an MTHFR mutation I didn't know about. I mean, there were so many other things going on in this soup that could have contributed to it. Um, 
And again, was it the fact that I was in chlorine several days a week uh, swimming? You know, again, like you talk swimming about Swimming pool's iodine. not good, you guys. Swimming pools are probably not good. That chlorine breaks down. There are people that have polymorphisms in the, in the detoxification system that breaks down the chlorine byproducts of swimming pools. Like again, live a radical life. Swim in lakes and rivers. Be careful with swimming pools. I love it. Totally. And here's the thing, like, I love swimming so much. So now I'm just like, ah, so I do it like every, like, you know, 10 days once, and then I'll rub coconut all over my body first and try to like do everything I can. And I don't swim that long, but I love it so much. And right now, you know, you live uh, in Malibu, just go in the ocean. Oh my God. No. Hey man, there's sharks out there. I'm not doing that. No, I'll go stand up paddle anytime in the ocean. But so, I mean, you know, it, so that could have been part of it. Um, so selenium is really key um, in the conversion process. And here's the thing though. So when you're hypothyroid, Everything's sluggish and slow, which includes the production of hydrochloric acid when you're chewing food and then things don't get broken down, then they don't digest. And that's why thyroid patients often become extremely low in iron, no matter how much meat they're eating. We've got to talk about the ferritin connection here in a minute. And then also vitamin D, B12, like you just become low in a sort of nutrients, including selenium, and you can't hold on to it. So if you're seriously hypothyroid and you have horrible gut issues and you're a mess, then two Brazil nuts a day might not do it. And at that point, and again, I don't know what your opinion on this, but I've always been told and have seen that the most absorbable form, at least in terms of supplementation form, is SE-methyl-L-selenocysteine, um, which I know life extension cells and some other people. So you might have to go to a supplement first before you get everything back to normal and kind of hit it a little bit harder. But yeah, Brazil nuts, and there's lots of other things that have selenium in them that are really helpful to life. But yes, getting proper meat, selenium. Meat. Yeah, meat. An there you animal go. Meat, foods, yeah. meat. There are, there, are, there are two types of selenium in supplements. There's selenomethionine and selenocysteine. And selenocysteine is rare in supplements. Most supplements are selenomethionine and they're poorly yes. absorbed. And yes. you can definitely get toxic in selenium. So do not over supplement with selenium. I don't think Brazil nuts are the best source of selenium. I would just do animal meats and liver from good sources. And I think that it's much more absorbable. It's probably in that selenocysteine form rather than selenomethionine, which is what's in all the supplements and it's not yes. very absorbable. But don't Right, I'm too, glad you think that toxic. way too. Yeah, because yeah, most get people get the, the, the ion. Yeah. yeah, and I think it's, you know, sometimes patients always say like, well, look, you know, I mean, you might want to do 200 micrograms a day for a couple months, then fractally dose it and then kind of chill and do food. You know, it, it depends on where you are and how bad the situation is. Um, so it, it, here's the thing. It, it wreaks havoc on the conversion issues also too. So heavy metals, I mean, forget thyroid for a second, we're talking about like mitochondrial dysfunction. So you already have mitochondrial dysfunction when you're hypothyroid and then you're like packing on extra. So there's so many ways to go about investigating Lyme's disease, uh, you know, that things like that, inflammatory issues going on. You could have cancer. Something like cancer can screw up this whole feedback loop again, because it's such a state of inflammation or any state of inflammation. And this is why we'll get into why type two diabetes and thyroid issues go hand in hand. Do you know what I'm saying? Um, so Essentially, the reverse T3 problem, so I solved it the first time with natural desiccated thyroid. It backfired on me. I went back to doctors. Again, they all failed me. And let me just tell you about this. Let me tell you a couple of things I've heard about reverse T3. So one was that um, a, pay, a doctor tried to put me on more natural desiccated thyroid, even though I had a reverse T3 problem. And I said, hey, you, you're going to actually hurt me. You know, you're giving me more of the thing that's converting into the thing that doesn't matter. Um, and he just did not understand this. I tried to explain everything I've explained to you. Like he just would not see it. So I was like, all right. So I knew I was on my own again, a second time in a decade. So I had to dose myself back to health with T3 only again, shouldn't have had to do this. Okay. Like, I mean, I shouldn't have had to do this. I'm in Los Angeles. I went to so many doctors. Um, so after that, I realized, you know, and that's again, why I wrote the book, because I would run into so many patients and people, and I keep giving them advice on what to test and what to look, look for. Um, T3 only though is a last resort. And if you're out there and you're thinking like, oh, it's a fat burner, I'll just take a bunch of T3. Nope, good luck, guess what? It's gonna backfire on you because too much T3 can make you fat and bloated too, in a state of inflammation. We really are Goldilocks, not too hot, not too cold, and everyone's different. So someone might go, well, what's a proper free T3 level? I guarantee, I don't know what your labs are, but I would say that if we tested your thyroid today, Paul, I mean, I'm sure that it's classic, like a lot of people, Mark and Brad and fit guys, where it's probably in the middle of the range. Am I right? Uh, on a carnivore diet, and we're going to get into this. A little low. So we're going to get into this. It's not low. It's just at the low end of normal range, quote unquote. It's like two, I want to say, I'd have to two pull nine. up the numbers. It's like two, yeah, maybe something like that. So I want to talk sense. about, so we're going to get to this in this podcast, yeah. you guys, low carb ketogenic diets and free T3, because this is where the whole thyroid conversation goes 
when we're eating this way. So it's low normal. And mm -hmm. we will probably talk about why that's not a problem. And, and we'll, yes. we'll, un we'll unpack all of that. But yeah. So um, I don't know where to go next or what I should touch on here. I want to highlight something you said about the GI stuff, because I just want to say, if your gastroenterologist is not checking your thyroid, you need a new gastroenterologist. Because if you are on betaine HCL, digestive enzymes, if you have if you have SIBO, if you have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, if you have IBS, if you have a GI issue, if you have low B12, if you are malabsorbing things, and your gastroenterologist is not checking your thyroid in the way that we are talking about, then he is not, he or she is not thinking about this holistically or in terms of a, uh, a total thing. So again, we get back to the idea, medical specialties hurt patients. Your gastroenterologist is just thinking he cares about your stomach, your small intestine, your bowels, maybe your gallbladder and your pancreas, and then he's good. He or she is good. So can't, can't think about it from that perspective. Um, I want to pause here for a moment and just back up a little bit. So we've gone so far down the rabbit hole. We've talked about T4 to T3 conversion. We talked about reverse T3. I want to come back to that. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit about things that might cause hypothyroidism for people other than T4 to T3 conversion problems, right? So this is really interesting. So there are many other things that can cause inadequate production of T4. So now we're kind of down the rabbit hole. We're down the cascade, TSH, T4, T3. Let's just back up. What can cause hypothyroidism that's even further up the cascade if people aren't even making enough T4? Maybe they're not even getting enough uh, TSH. So there's all these other interesting things. Let's talk about the toxic elements, the halides, and then I'll talk about cruciferous vegetables and broccoli and how they're all trying to kill your thyroid. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, you know what? Gosh, so many things. I mean- you mentioned a few. We talked about heavy metals. Yeah, heavy metals, um, chlorine, right? Mm -hmm. uh, any kind of toxic elements. Even um, too much iodine can throw up, screw up a thyroid as a, and, and make you have bad symptoms. We'll talk uh, about that. I do not think people should be over-supplementing with iodine. There is a protocol out there from Brownstein that I disagree with wholeheartedly. Uh, you should not be using Lugol's iodine. That is way too concentrated for your thyroid. You don't need a thousand micrograms of iodine a day. You, we can talk about how much you need. It's probably between 100 and 200 or 300 micrograms of iodine. More than that, it's not a good thing. And I'm I love so glad you said that because I mentioned that in my book and so does the doctor on my book who says, Dr. Brownstein, who wrote this book on like why everyone needs iodine, you know, maybe that's his set of patients, but that's not really what I see when I talk to lots of other doctors. And Lugol's iodine, like you said, is very strong. Now, if you're going to go on a walking tour of Chernobyl, yeah, maybe, maybe bring a bottle of iodine with you. But unless you are like near nuclear disaster, nobody needs that level of iodine and it can actually screw up people with Hashimoto's and screw up your thyroid. Um, okay. So diet can really do it too, based on what I told you about the adrenal cortisol and blood glucose connection. Um, so what comes first? Someone, let's say, goes down a path where they overeat themselves into type 2 diabetes. Okay, let's just say it's not even, they just did it through diet, food addiction, whatever. Okay, fine. It's always unbeknownst to us, but we give it to ourselves. So let's say they're in type 2 diabetes. Well, at that point, because of the blood glucose situation and insulin resistance, they are likely going to have thyroid problems. In that case, Perhaps they don't need thyroid hormone right away. They just need to get that fixed. That happens too. So that can cause thyroid issues. So type 2 diabetes is a slippery slope into other things as well, including hypothyroidism. Um, and again, what we know about the reverse T3 system, major stress, starvation, over dieting, over exercising, all of these things can be sending the wrong signals for it to downregulate and not pump out as much as it needs to. So again, this regulation of the system or paying attention to how we treat it. And then I'd love, you know, definitely I want you to tell us about the goitrogens and, and food and other things that you think uh, might learn something here that um, affects and can cause hypothyroidism or for the thyroid system to get screwed up. Yeah. So one of the things I talk about in my book, The Carnivore Code, probably when this podcast comes out, it is live, you guys. If you do not own a copy of my book, shame on you. Well, not really, but I hope you will read it and check it out and let me know what you think. Audiobook, ebook, whatever. Um, in the book, I talk about oxalates, number one. This is super fascinating. And I talk about an autopsy series in which they found oxalate deposits in more than 70% of autopsies. So why are oxalates in the thyroid? L, are you aware of any physiologic role for oxalic acid in the thyroid? I'm not. And no, I also it, know it, that no. that can be a problematic <clears throat> food source for a lot of people when they're overeating those foods. Right. So I think that the 
unless there is a new medical diagnosis or a discovery on the horizon, oxalate, oxalic acid does not belong in your thyroid any day of the week, any month of the year, any year of your life, okay? So when we are finding oxalate in more than 70% of thyroids, the number might even be higher, might even be 80%, oxalate is getting deposited in tissues of our body. This is causing problems, I believe. There, the research is compelling. In the whole oxalate chapter in the book, I talk about oxalate in the breast tissue, oxalate injected into mammary fat pads in mice causing tumors. Uh, there's a lot of people that feel that oxalate deposition in breast tissue may cause cancer, right? May. We're still trying to figure out if it's connected with ductal carcinoma in situ and other types of precancerous lesions in breasts of women, or potentially even men, because men get breast cancer too. But oxalate does not belong in the thyroid. And in people who have Hashimoto's, we see lower levels of oxalate in the thyroid. And that originally sounds kind of strange. But then you think, wait a minute, what if part of the autoimmunity happening in Hashimoto's is a response to the oxalate to pull it out? right? That's a hypothesis. We don't know. But is it possible, because there's a correlation between lower levels of oxalate and people with Hashimoto's, is it possible that there's an autoimmune insult to the thyroid that is happening because oxalate is getting deposited there, and then the body is trying to pull some of that oxalate out, and as you are actually mounting an immune response to the thyroid against antithyroglobulin, antithyroid peroxidase, you are destroying thyroid cells, and the immune system is ingesting it, pulling it out, it's getting excreted. Who knows? It's very fascinating. That correlation is striking and compelling. So oxalate does not belong in your thyroid. In the book, I talk about um, all sorts of things regarding that and which foods are higher in oxalate. I'm going to do a little screen share for people um, who are watching on the YouTubes. If you are not and you want to see these articles uh, in person, uh, you are welcome to go to the YouTube uh, video that marks these timestamps. Interesting paper, role of dietary iodine and cruciferous vegetables in thyroid cancer, countrywide case study in New Caledonia. So these are Melanesian women, a high, this, the high consumption of cruciferous vegetables among Melanesian women, <clears throat> a group with mild iodine deficiency may contribute, may, can, it may explain the exceptionally high incidence of thyroid cancer in this group. So this is fascinating uh, that in this Melanesian population, they are concerned about goitrogenic foods. These are cruciferous vegetables that have isothiocyanates like sulforaphane, which compete with iodine at the level of the thyroid. And they, this may be a correlation between higher rates of thyroid cancer. I've got a couple more articles, but I'll let you jump in. Did you? Yeah. I wanna, uh, do, can I jump in on that one for a second? So that's really fascinating. I'm so glad you brought that up. Uh, so I actually did a I'll, I'll toot my own heart. It's an award-winning documentary. It has to do with Melanesia and Papua New Guinea and Solomon Islands. Uh, it has nothing to do with health, but um, one of the things that really ticked me off about fork over knives is that they claimed that um, people in Melanesia were healthy because they ate low fat, which is really not true. But this is what I'm wondering. So it's almost like what's happened in the Pacific in Hawaii. Like cruciferous vegetables are not necessarily like native to, them. like that's not their native diet, Paul. Do you know what I'm saying? They were living off of like pork, coconut, fish. That's why they also probably didn't have iodine issues. Now, I don't know the toxicity of their fish currently, but uh, assuming back in the day when thing, the, our oceans weren't a mess, um, they were probably getting enough iodine from the sea, sea vegetables, et cetera, right? But only when, you know, exempt, same in Hawaii, their only starch or carb at the time was taro root. When they started to introduce right and sugar cane and all that stuff to Hawaiians, this is like a, a, the obesity epidemic there is startling and it's really obvious because the population is so small. So it seems like when you go there that everybody's obese, you know, in a lot of ways. So it's interesting that that study is from Melanesia because I'm just like, well, why are they eating so many crisper vegetables? That's not their native diet really. You know what I'm saying? I think it's mostly cassava. So I talk about this yeah. in the book as well. So cassava is eaten throughout the South America and Polynesian islands. I think it's probably not native, although I, I, it may be, it may Maybe. grow there. But cassava is highly toxic. You have to detoxify it. Cassava has both isothiocyanates. There's a whole chapter in my book on these, you guys. And, um, and also uh, hydrocyanic acid. Uh, and there's multiple toxins in, in cassava. So, so you do not suggest using cassava flour or cassava in any kind of uh, cooking? I'm assuming, big, I mean, not for you, big, but... Big problem, big problem. Okay. Yeah, because, I mean... The cassava flour is going to have the linamarin, which is what breaks down into hydrocyanic acid, removed. But how many isothiocyanates, how many goitrogenic substances? Goitrogen means making a goiter, making a big neck. 
from hypothyroid because we are inhibiting iodine at the level of the thyroid. People, I talk about this all the time. People always get triggered when I'm throwing Rhonda Patrick under the bus. The only reason I'm throwing Rhonda Patrick under the bus, you guys, is because I have called her out 20 times and she just ignores me. So if you want to talk to me, you know, if, if you're, if she doesn't like what I'm saying about her sulforaphane idol, then come talk to me and show me why I'm wrong. But you know, when you don't respond to any of my criticisms, I think you're hurting people, Rhonda Patrick, and I'm going to call you out. So I'm not being disrespectful. I'm just calling it like it is, you guys. I want to show you guys a couple more articles on this. Um, so <clears throat> let's see if this will pull up. Here we go. This is a really interesting one. Concentrations of thiocyanate and goitrin in human plasma. Their precursor concentrations in brassica vegetables and associated potential risk for hypothyroidism. So this is what I talk about in the book, you guys. My concern is that consumption of goitrogenic vegetables, broccoli, cauliflower, turnip, collard greens, is going to lead to a risk of hypothyroidism because these thiocyanates, these isothiocyanates and goitrin compete with iodine at the level of the thyroid. If you read this paper, you will see that radioiodine uptake to the thyroid is inhibited by 194 micromolar of goitrin. And what they say is that there are multiple vegetables, collards, Brussels sprouts, and some Russian kale that contain significant amounts of goitrin to potentially decrease iodine uptake by the thyroid. Okay. Super. super what about the pretty. idea that people, so this is always a question I get asked where they're like, well, what about, so it's not raw cruciferous vegetables. Maybe the cooking of it really removes some of these elements. What are your thoughts on cooked versus raw? And is there a delineation there or is it, Hey, they're all the same damn vegetable and stay away. So the way that isothiocyanates work in vegetables is that they are, they are made from glucosinolates right? So glucosinolates are the precursor form. Uh, in the case of broccoli, it's glucoraphanin, which combines with myrosinase to break down into isothiocyanates, specifically sulforaphane. Cooking degrades myrosinase, but in your gut, bacteria make myrosinase. So even cooked cruciferous vegetables are going to give you sulforaphane. If you believe sulforaphane is a good thing, then you will still get it. If you believe sulforaphane is a bad thing, you will still get it. I believe it's a very bad thing. And this is a very clear indication of a plant booby trap. This is a plant toxin. So you will not avoid, you will not break down glucosinolates with cooking. The only thing that I'm aware of that can break down glucosinolates is fermentation. This is why our ancestors fermented cruciferous vegetables, in my opinion. One of the reasons, kimchi, sauerkraut, that is less toxic than raw cabbage because the glucosinolate precursors to sulforaphane are broken down in the fermentation process. But even though you can degrade myrosinase by cooking, there is myrosinase in your gut and you will still be exposed to sulforaphane and other isothiocyanates, even potentially with cassava and other vegetables that are cooked and milled and stuff. So it's not going to make it totally safe. Yeah. The sulforaphane, I wonder, is that is that mm, s similar to, so for example, the reason I was thinking about this, I was like, oh, this could have contributed to the issue too for me. Maybe we're making some discoveries here now, um, which is when I took some genetic testing, it did say that I had an issue possibly processing foods high in sulfur. Is that similar to that or is that a completely different? Sulforaphane. Just because sulfur is in the name. Right, that's right. Not, sulforaphane. Yeah, you know so forafane has a sulfur atom in it. So forafane actually has a cyanide molecule in it. So cyanide, yeah, is CN. So forafane is a, has a sulfur atom in it, but it's not necessarily, I don't know if that would be sulfurous. It might be, right, but right. yeah, yeah. I wanna I'll share a few more articles and we'll move on from this, guys. Hopefully this is helpful. So this is a cool one that I talk about in the book. Um, and this is green tea catechins. So goitrogenic antithyroidal potential of green tea extract in relation to catechin and rats. Admittedly, this is an animal study, and these doses are probably a little bit higher than most people are going to get with daily ingestion of a small amount of green tea. But as you'll see here, um, 1.5 gram percent, 2.5, 5% grams, um, they found that they say taken together, these results suggest the catechin present in green tea extract might behave as, anti, as an antithyroid agent, and possibly the consumption of green tea at high dose could alter thyroid function adversely. Why, yes, and most, sometimes why patients are we taking green tea? Well, yeah, and sometimes people who are taking thyroid hormone, that's a thing too. It's like, hey, how much better and faster do you want to get better? So let's eliminate these goitrogens and also like the excess green tea and things like that. Um, again, something to look at. How badly do you want to be better? It's worth the N equals one. 
how badly do you want to be radical, you guys? Why there would you, you not? <laughs> how badly do you want to be radical? Okay, last one. This is probably the best one for people. This is a summary paper that's really great. I'll, again, I'll share this one on YouTube. If you guys are listening, you can, um, I will probably post a, a video of this on my, YouTube, on my Instagram as a, as a snippet. But if you want to see the whole thing, go on YouTube and watch this ver- visually. The title of the article is Various Possible Toxicants Involved in Thyroid Dysfunction, a review. It's great. It goes through all these. It's well-referenced. We talked about many of these already. Excess dietary iodine, multiple reference here. Naturally occurring goitrogens. We talked about this. They are found in legumes plants, amiodarone, lithium, right? In addition to cabbage, cauliflower, broccoli. Soy, turnip, horrible. Uh, soy or soy, soy or soy enriching foods. Big problem. Um, the role of dietary fat talks about when they feed oxidized fats to rats, the thyroid doesn't function. Imagine that. If you eat canola oil, <laughs> your, your thyroid might not be happy. The role of green tea, okay? Soy and soybean products, cyanogenic plant foods, Cauliflower, cabbage, mustard, turnip, radish, bamboo shoot, cassava, okay? They have been shown to possess anti-TPO activity, right? Moreover, boiled extracts of these cyanogenic plant foods showed highest anti-TPO potential, followed by cooked and raw extracts. Goitrin is an active goitrogen present in the plants, rutabaga, turnip, and brassica seeds, all right? What does Rhonda Patrick want you to eat? Spinach or... uh, uh, broccoli sprout seeds. Okay. This is, this is the highest concentration, the highest concentration. Uh, a r- roll of groundnut. Not a lot of people eat groundnut. Roll of millet. Oh, wait, hold on. Doesn't it say though? It says though up there, if you look at that, it does say cooking destroys the enzyme responsible for So you just covered that, but so they got it wrong there too? Yep. They got it wrong. They're not accounting for myrosinase produced in the gut. In the gut. Okay. Yep. Yep. The role of millet, selenium deficiency, and B, vitamin B12 deficiency implicated in autoimmune thyroiditis. Bisphenol I, bisphenol A, triclosan. Um, these, are, these are xenoestrogens. I did a whole podcast with Anthony J, you guys, if you want to do that. Perchlorates found in rocket fuels. Study conducted on pregnant women living in an industrial area in Southern California. Strong association between urinary perchlorate and decreased total and free thyroxin levels and TSH. Cosmetics. UV filters. This is, this is sunscreen, you guys. This is sunscreen. A sunny on benzophenone 2, uh, which is a sunscreen chemical, another chemical, OMC. Uh, I won't read that name. Um, maybe I will read that name. Octi, <laughs> octomethoxy cinnam- cinnamonate nice. causes dose-dependent decreases in serum T3 and T4 concentration. What are you using for sunscreen? parabens, UV filters in your sunscreen or your cosmetics could affect this. Heavy metals, we talked about this. Cadmium and lead, all right? This is a great paper. Um, Smoking, thyroid abnormalities, role of age. So this paper really highlights all of the things that we were just talking about. People can find that paper. Um, Again, it's uh, it's in the video. It'll be in the Instagram snippet. But that, if you avoid those things, and we've, I think we've touched on all of those, um, you will probably put your thyroid in a much better position. So, but you yeah. know, I want to talk about soy for a second. So we hate it. It's horrible. Nobody should do it, but here's the thing. So yes, it robs you of your thyroid and it's terrible for men, of course, specifically, but, um, Beyond Burgers. It's, it's in one of the burgers. So it's in, it's in Impossible or Beyond. I forget which one. They use soy protein. It's going to make use... it impossible for you to live well. Is yeah. that <laughs> that's, the real, that's the real thing, right? <laughs> that's the real thing. But I also wanted to mention, um, the reason I, th- I thought about soy, I thought about men and testosterone. So I want to get back to real quick and just touch on this. So men do have hypothyroidism too. It is disproportionately a women's disease. So men will often be overlooked for it. If you're a guy and you have energy issues or you're not getting erections in the morning and you should at a certain age for a very long time, guys. So if that's happening, you know, and you're not 80, please call your functional medicine doctor or Paul. But here's the thing. So it'll be overlooked and they'll just do exogenous hormone replacement. Exactly. You don't need testosterone. You need to correct the thyroid. You don't need Prozac. You need to correct the thyroid. You don't. Oftentimes, you have to exhaust this first. You have to check the thyroid first. Or it's, because by the way, as I've seen it get screwed up, someone as young as 25 with really low T, no one can figure it out. They're on the right diet. They're on the right paradigm, but yet it's still happening. Well, it's their thyroid. Once you regulate this, that's why I don't have PCOS and never had it since I regulated my thyroid or any gynecological problem is because we got to the root to the master. This got corrected everything else will fall in place. The symphony of hormone production. Again, thyroid, 
responsible for production and regulation of your hormones. So this goes for guy with testosterone too. Mm -hmm. um, again, we know it could be affected by lifestyle, it could be over-exercising, that's why you have low T and maybe it's just that. But again, you have to get the thyroid assessed first before taking any exogenous hormones. I, I couldn't agree more. And that's why I said earlier, if you are going to a male hormone replacement doctor and getting TRT and that man or woman is not replacing, is not looking at your thyroid, that's, they're, they're not thinking about things comprehensively. So geez, we could go on forever. All right, let's wrap up with this. Um, let's talk about low carb diets and thyroid, ketogenic diets and thyroid. One of the things you talk about in the paleo thyroid solution, one of the things that I know Mark is an advocate for um, is you know, a moderate low carb diet. A carnivore diet is a very low carb diet. It's not a zero carb diet. There are actually some carbohydrates in liver from glycogen and honey is an animal, is an animal food source that, you know, maybe have carbohydrates and I am not anti-carbohydrates, but I think that there's a graphic in the book that I appreciate. I think that maybe this is a good time to talk about this as well. The more I've been kind of turning this over in my head, people that listen to the podcast will also know that I've done two long podcasts with Chris Masterjohn. There's over five hours of Chris Masterjohn and I talking. The second of those, we talked a lot about ketosis. I think you guys would agree with this, but I would love to get your perspective. If anyone listening to this goes in the wilderness, which I hope you guys do because it's good for your soul, as I talked about with Chris, Master, Chris Kresser, um, there are not many carbohydrates in the wilderness. I really believe that ketosis, probably low level ketosis, not like medical grade ketosis, not ketones of four or five, though ketone levels are gonna be different for every person. I think that low level ketosis with ketones between maybe zero and one, or I should say 0.2 or 0.1 and one, are probably where we lived as humans for our entire evolution. You know, I have done a couple of carbohydrate reintroduction experiments and um, I'll talk about those in a future podcast because I was curious. Uh, the, the short of that is that I didn't really see any difference. I didn't see any difference in the way I felt or any improvements in the gym. Um, but even with carbohydrate reintroduction experiments with moderate amounts of carbohydrates between maybe 50 and 100 grams of carbohydrates a day, I was still in ketosis for a lot of the day in the morning when I wake up, right? Uh, in order to not be in ketosis, an ancestral man or woman human would have to work insanely hard you have to get probably more than 200 grams or 300 grams of carbohydrates a day to not be in ketosis. And this gets to these kind of murky definitions of what a low carb diet is. I'll get your thoughts on this. Um, but I think that any moderate to quote low carb diet that has less than, I think in the book, you guys set the limit at like 150 grams of carbs ish. Yeah. Any yeah that, well, that's Mark's thing, which is like, hey, his whole thing from the beginning in Primal Blueprint, and that's the Primal Blueprint, not his keto reset carb. But it's like, hey, most Americans are doing over 150 grams of total heart carbohydrates a day. If you're a bricklayer or a professional athlete, that might be appropriate, but it's not for most people. So, you know, that was sort of a guideline by which, but 150 grams a day would be too much for me. I'm 5'2, I'm a small woman. So, and even though I work out. So, again, you know, and we could talk about what we think is low carb. I mean, I think honestly, below 80 grams total of carbohydrates is a good place to start for most people. If they are just don't know where to go, that might be a good place to start. I feel best when I'm lower, although I fluctuate, like I might have some go, go have a carb out situation one day, but for the most part, I feel better uh, with a, a pretty low carb diet like yeah. below 50. Yeah. And in the book, I talk about a carnivore ish diet and I'm very clear that I don't think carbs are the enemy necessarily for people unless the carbs are packaged in plant food that is toxic for you right? Wheat and grains being much worse than what I discuss in the book in the spectrum of plant toxicity, like less toxic sources of carbohydrates, berries, non-sweet fruit, avocado, maybe, maybe things like that. But yeah, I think that there's reasonable amounts of carbohydrates that our ancestors may have obtained from time to time. I just can't imagine how our ancestors or, or, or our, our, our ancestry, our genetics would have ever been programmed by 300 grams of carbohydrates a day for any amount of time. And there it's wasn't hypothyroidism. And how do we know this? Because you know what? Uh, population wouldn't have happened. Okay. So the yeah. first incident, the first incidents of thyroid issues on the record are, I think it's like 12,000 years ago in China, yeah. oddly enough, and I make this connection, I'm not saying it's true, but oddly enough, uh, the emperor at the times, it was emperor five grains. It's what grains were introduced to. So grains, we didn't talk about that, but they're horribly offensive, particularly to people with Hashimoto's. Motos, I would argue to all human beings, but I would say that grains, particularly gluten, we know for sure are associated with so with antibodies. You can see the difference. Someone's got 300 TPO antibodies. They go 
gluten-free, even at the minimum gluten-free, not necessarily grain-free, it will drop to 25. That yeah. is the goal. And in that paper I just talked about, millet, you know, uh, quinoa can also do it though. It's a yes, pseudo grain, probably pseudo less grain. so, you yeah. know, but the grains, I mean, the grains are probably the first thing to get out Absolutely. Um, in, in these diets. So this, that's super important. I love that you highlighted that in the book and I'm glad that we brought that up because I wanted to. Yeah. Like the 12,000 years ago is the Neolithic revolution. That is when we started farming as humans. No kidding. No, or why are we not surprised that that was the first historical reference to hypothyroidism? And by the way, just, you know, going back to one of my favorite uh, director writers who wrote The Perfect Human Diet, which I think is like still holds up even after seven years. It's like one of the best um, documentary, paleo documentaries. We could, uh, paleontologists never saw rheumatoid arthritis on the archaeological record until 10,000 years ago. All of the samples of all the human beings that they ever saw before that for all the time we've been involved, never did it show up. Oh, well, isn't it just a coincidence that it showed up with agricultural revolution? Not surprised. But you know what? I want to get into this low-carb keto and whether it's bad for thyroid or not. So here's the thing. Um, okay. First of all, yeah, our ancestors didn't have thyroid problems. They would have never had pregnancies. Nothing would ever work out based on what I've told you about uh, you know, fertility and stuff and the thyroid. Um, so this is what happens. Anyone who claims that keto or low carb is bad for a thyroid, first of all, I would love to see the evidence. And here's a couple of things that are presented. First of all, people that are going to a low carb or keto diet, let's, let's see where they're at already. They're usually overweight. They've tried every other diet, right? Maybe they already have a thyroid problem. Let's see what their thyroid stuff was before they even attempted it, okay? So if you are super hypothyroid and you're not necessarily insulin resistant or maybe a little bit, not necessarily a keto low carb diet could get you on the right path, but it may not completely solve it, okay? So someone might go, oh, it just made it worse for me. Did it? Or was like that not really the problem in the beginning? Or did you have all of these other issues? What were your metals? What were all the things we're talking about? Don't blame that on it. Here's the other thing. Some people would say, and this is why your, your T3 is probably 2.9 and why Ben Greenfield uh, also pro has that a little bit below the mid-range. Here's why. Because you guys are metabolically efficient, you're calorically efficient, and then you become what I call T3 efficient. So I used to be on 100 micrograms a day of T3. I'm, not on, I'm now on between like 20 and 25, depending. Um, and why did that happen? Because over time, like that's what I needed at one point to function. As I got paleo, as I cleaned stuff up, as the years go by, I'm becoming more metabolically efficient, more calorically efficient, and then more T3 efficient. I need less T3 to operate on. And frankly, it is the minimum effective dose. So hummingbirds, you know what? Yeah, their metabolism, you don't want a fast metabolism. That's what Mark says. He's like, hummingbirds, you know, they're like dead in a minute, right? Yeah. <laughs> you don't want a fast metabolism. That's actually not what you want. Um, and people might go, wait a minute. You want a, a proper metabolism, a too fast metabolism being hyperthyroid. And again, it's inflammatory, it can backfire, and it causes all sorts of other problems. So some doctor might look at your free T3 and go, I don't know, it's, it's a little bit low, are you okay? Hey, here's the answer. Do you have any symptoms? How are you doing? How's your temperature? What's your pulse like? What's your heart rate? <laughs> I mean, what's your blood pressure? I mean, there's so many other ways to determine. We don't just go based on yes. blood tests, which is what keeps patients sick too, because yes. there's people on T3 only or thyroid hormone that need to have their free T3 at the top of the range. They're not over metabolic. They are not hyperthyroid. That's what they need for them. We can't almost test like, you know, uh, hormone receptor sensitivity in people. So while you may do well, well, you're not on any medication, it makes sense. But there are people also that are told, oh my God, you have to lower your medication because we're afraid you're hyper. Okay, hyper is not just a word you determine based on blood tests. There's other diagnostics to figure that out. When you're hyperthyroid, and I have been, because I've been on too much T3, it doesn't feel good. Your hands and feet are hot. You're sweaty. Um, it's uh, You're pooping all the time. <clears throat> There's temperature regulation issues, there's, there's mental things, there's so many things that go into this. You have an elevated resting heart rate. So for example, you might wake up and have a heart rate of like 96. Okay, yeah, that's hyperthyroidism. So a doctor saying, and by the way, I talk fast as you mentioned. I had a doctor tell me they thought I was hyperthyroid just because they're like, I can tell by how fast you talk. I'm like, have we met? I'm from downtown <laughs> Chicago. We walk fast, we talk fast. Like what a great guy, well, what a genius doctor you are. So you're metabolically efficient. You need less T3 to function than, than maybe the average American who's in the mid-range, who's on a standard American diet, or even just maybe a generally 
kind of not, but low carb, but not your version of low carb diet. So, um, so that's what we see. So then a doctor might go, oh, they went keto, their T3 dropped. That means they're hypothyroid. Does it? Have you asked them about their symptoms? Again, Mark Sisson and Brad Kearns, both told by two doctors that they were worried about them. When I was speaking at FitCon uh, last year in Salt Lake, some guy asked me a question and this happened to Mark and Brad too. He asked me a question. He said, you know, I, I woke up, I went to the gym. Uh, he's not on thyroid hormones. Woke up, went to the gym. He's fasting. He goes and gets his blood taken. And then the TSH was like 3.5 or 4. Now that's a snapshot. It's going to it's, it's gonna fluctuate throughout the day, which is why you never use that as the base of measurement to determine the thyroid problem. And you have to look at the other tests. You know what I mean? So had they tested the free T3 and free T4, they would have seen, yeah, this is normal. The, the signal was just shooting out because the guy just worked out, man. So then, of course, I'm sure the, 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 the blood got a little low in thyroid hormones and the pituitary in the brain were like, hey, yo, thyroid, wake up. And so at the time of the needle into his arm, the TSH was at 3.5, and they literally, just based on that, said, here's a prescription for Synthroid. Are you kidding me? So this is what happens all the time. Um, but again, to blame keto or low carb, in fact, if anything, because of how hypothyroidism causes insulin resistance. And it's not just that a diet can solve it. Sometimes you need thyroid hormone like me, okay? But at the end of the day, if you have gotten to hypothyroidism likely because you ate yourself there into type two diabetes, then yes, adjusting your diet could correct the whole damn thing. Either way, you wanna shoot for this paradigm because it is the ultimate in the hormones you're either swallowing like I do every day or the ones that your own body is breaking are going to be metabolized properly. Because Paul, it's not just enough that the brain sends the signal and your thyroid says, great, we're pumping it out. Now what happens when this, the shiz is pumped out? Is it getting to where it needs to go? Is it affecting the cells properly? Is it converting? And that, a lot of it, 99% of it probably, aside from these other heavy metals and things we're talking about, is based on your glucose management and cortisol levels. Adrenal and glucose are managed pristinely by a low carb paradigm. This I love is. it. I love it. Exactly. And so this is what I was, I was highlighting this earlier in our discussion. We were talking about reverse T3 because I want to highlight the difference here. Reverse T3 does not elevate on ketogenic low carb diets, right? So we're, what, what people see is that in starvation states, free T3 will go down, you know, we'll get the reverse T3 and we'll get what's called euthyroid sick or starvation because TSH will not elevate. But Western medicine has never seen a ketogenic thyroid panel. And so they just get completely confused and they say, your free T3 is at the low end of normal, but your TSH is within normal. Sometimes the TSH is very normal, quote unquote, you know, it's 1.5 or one. And they're saying you have euthyroid sick syndrome or something is going on because they just can't understand what's going on. But as you're suggesting, there appears to be receptor sensitivity. There appears to be sensitivity that changes in the way our body responds to T3. How do we know this? Studies comparing ketogenic diets to non-ketogenic diets and weight loss suggest no differences or improvements on a ketogenic diet. If your basal metabolic rate were really going down, if your T3 activity at the receptor, if your metabolic engine were really running cold, with a low T3, we would see weight gain. We would see height. We would see bradycardia. We would see slowing of the pulse rate. We would see low body temperature. And we would see in these studies that a ketogenic diet doesn't work for weight loss because you are slowing your metabolism and your reverse T3 would go up. We do yeah, not by see the way, my, any of my, those things. My temperature was 96 degrees all day long when I was hypothyroidism all day long. We're supposed right. to be 98, 6, 98.6 for a reason. Now, Couple point differences, not gonna kill anybody here. But at the end of the day, you can test your temps at home, basal and afternoon for five days in a row to not only assess adrenal sufficiency, but um, to also assess hypothyroidism. I mean, that's kind of where you start. And if you're freezing all the time, and again, there's 40 symptoms list listed in my book, do you have any symptoms? Like I asked Ben Greenfield, okay, your free G3 is 2.9, but I know that he's so metabolically efficient. I know what he does that, you know, Ben's not complaining about, about hypothyroidism. I don't see you complaining about hypothyroid symptoms. I don't see, uh, you know, and again, so in the absence of that, just a blood test doesn't say hypothyroidism. 
just, and, a, and yeah, and by itself. Isolate, I mean, sometimes a, there's you know something like, oh my gosh, if you have a TSH of 150, which I've seen at some point, but you, what is that associated with? Symptoms. Her pulse was like 30. You know, she's practically near death. And and what is that? A, a if the range is zero to five on a TSH, 150 is literally like the brain screaming, like please give her thyroid hormone. She's about to die. Please, 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 die. please, please. Yes. Right. So we were like, oh my gosh, how are you living? She said, that's what my doctor said. I'm like, exactly. So, but a TSH within that range can fluctuate again. So that's why it's not the proper assessment. It is necessary in the scheme of all of these tests, but that is why it is the most harmful thing if a doctor just tests it because they really aren't getting to the bottom of it and they misdiagnose based on it and they mistreat based on it. So do ketogenic and low carb diets cause thyroid problems? I would say no. Um, also too, we have to understand that a lot of people do ketogenic diets and low carb diets incorrectly. Um, meaning sometimes, you know, it's, listen, when you get your appetite satiated at first and you go keto, it can be very exciting for someone that had like a sugar, you know, addiction. And so you kind of get off on that a little bit and you end up not eating enough calories. And again, exactly. there we go back into the new thyroid kind of, right. You want to touch on that a bit? Do you know what I'm going at here? Right. I know you know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And there's, and I've talked about this multiple times on podcast. Like if you are hypocaloric, then you are losing, then, then your, then your hormones are going to have a problem, right? If you are trying to lose weight and you are going to create a caloric deficit, that's a good thing. If you are trying to maintain weight or build muscle mass, being hypocaloric is a bad thing. And I think a lot of people run into this on ketogenic carnivore low carb diets. It's very easy to be hypocaloric because the foods are so satiating. Totally. In my experience on carnivore diets, people run into it because they're too low fat. Uh, they're not eating enough fat. Like you said, low carb, low, fa low carb, low fat, high protein is rabbit starvation. And people are not getting enough fat on their carnivore diet. You cannot just eat uh, steak all day, you guys. You cannot just eat steak all day. You especially cannot just eat lean meat all day. And you are going to have thyroid problems then, I believe. So you have to get enough fat, you have to get enough calories, and then we will be in a ketogenic state. Like I said, a low level ketogenic state, which I believe recapitulates our ancestral norm. We probably were not in ketosis 100% of the time, but I suspect it was 80 to 90 at low levels. And so for anyone, whether it's Chris Master John or anyone to suggest that ketones are harmful for humans or that ketosis is harmful for humans, I've just got to think like that is evolutionarily inappropriate or incongruous. Of course, we have to be rigorous scientifically. And I did that long podcast with Chris where I debated him. We looked at the literature, which does not support that ketogenic diets long term are harmful for humans in any way, shape or form. And I think that that's evolutionarily reasonable because I think we've always had ketones. Babies have ketones all the time. You know, I have a two year old niece. She's adorable. Uh, w within two hours of eating, she's going to be back in ketosis, you guys, you know, and she's going to have ketones all day. Pregnant women have ketones all the time. Tell me again how ketones are harmful for humans. You know, it just doesn't make sense. So, and again, ketogenic physiology, I think works. It's the problem here is that Western medicine has never seen ketogenic physiology because we have always been so focused on carbs. I'm not anti-carbohydrates. I just think that there, there are changes in the lipid panel that happen on, on low carb diets. There are changes in the thyroid panel that happen on low carb diets and Western medicine has never seen either of these. And so they just freak out. So that's, what's interesting. I think that we need to retrain physicians or have an entire course in medical school Maybe I'll teach it. Who knows? You know, like how to look at a ketogenic patient's labs. Well, you know? and I want to touch on testosterone here again for, for the guys out there and in general. So, okay, um, cause this happened to people I know. So you, you go keto, but you're not getting enough calories or enough right. nutrients because you're so satiated. Then you might be doing some overactivity in some kind of physical capacity. And then you look at labs and it looks like thyroid's a little screwy and testosterone's low. Does that mean that you have a thyroid problem that affects your testosterone? No, let's look at your diet. Let's look at your workout. This happened to Brad Kearns and he doesn't mind me sharing it. He loves speed golf, as you know, and speed golf is a pretty crazy activity. So when he was doing the keto experiment, writing the book with Mark, um, we, we, he was like, you know, he was not getting good recovery. The testosterone had dropped a bit and the thyroid looked a little, and it was like, what's happening? And I said, well, hold on a minute, dude. I said, you're, you're doing speed golf. I don't think you realize that you're actually accidentally falling into chronic cardio, which he's been writing about for years, but it was just so much fun for him, you know, that he was just kind of overdoing it a bit. And he was actually so satiated that when he really looked at his caloric intake based on also that activity, it was not right. Once he changed that, the thyroid was normal. And not only that, the testosterone shot back up to like literally like high school levels. Okay. Right. So is it always even, so even if the thyroid then testosterone is low, does that mean the person has a thyroid problem? No, you might need to look at that other element, which is diet and lifestyle. And this is why it's so important. So anyway, 
I love it. Talk about this for four hours. I know, I know. We'll have to do a part two. We'll have to do a part two. So thank you so much for coming on. Where can people find more of your stuff? We talked about your book. Where can people find more of your stuff, Elle? Sure. So um, uh, The Paleothyroid Solution and my other new book, Confident as F-U asterisk K, is on Amazon. And uh, there's the first one. You can always go to lruss.com, E-L-L-E-R-U-S-S. On there, I have a tab. This free thyroid guide. It not only gives you all of the tests and more that we just talked about, like ferritin and B12. We didn't even get to ferritin. But we talk about that stuff. So that's in there. And also what's on there is here's a list of questions to go call the doctor's office to even see if that might even be a worthwhile trip for you, because right. I can tell you the things that now can't guarantee it, but that's part of it. So I have a free thyroid guide there. That's really comprehensive as well. You, you can just get started there and don't need to buy the book. Um, and then of course I host uh, Mark Sisson's primal blueprint podcast, which uh, you've been on a couple of times, which is awesome. And that's every Monday we release a new episode. And so you can pretty much find that anywhere, Apple and wherever you get your uh, podcast. I love it. And I highly recommend the book. It's really good. If you guys have questions about this, Elle breaks it down. She talks about her regimen, but she goes into more detail. Like we talked about, look, you guys, doctors, there are some really smart doctors out there, but there are a lot of really, really smart people who have experience and Elle is one of them. And um, this is probably, I think, one of the, the best resource for thyroid for patients if people have questions. And it's not a book written by a doctor. And that's probably a very good thing because it means that Elle can think outside of the box and Elle has her own personal experience. So that's amazing. So the last question- I do question, want to throw in there, sorry, I do want to throw in real quick. There is a great Q&A in the back of my book with a functional medicine doctor, Dr. Gary Forsman. Yeah. And what's great about that is he really explains why, as a doctor, why do other doctors get it wrong? Why do they have an ego? Why don't they look into these things? So he really has a really interesting perspective on that. And it's, it's just good to learn, or you can take that part to your doctor, maybe have them read that, you know, but again, you will hear from a doctor in my book and there's a, the, the Q and A in the back is definitely worthwhile. So I just wanted to point that out. Have your doctor listen to this podcast, you guys. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> people do this. I love it. They're like, my, yeah, I gave should. your, I gave, this is why I do this, you guys. This is why I do this podcast. Let your doctor, have your doctor listen to this podcast or send them the snippet that I'm going to post on Instagram. It's five minutes of like the highlights. Like have your doctor listen to me and L and the other stuff so that they can think about lipids and think about thyroid. And if your gastroenterologist doesn't check thyroid, he needs, he or she needs to hear this podcast. That's it. Um, what is the most radical thing that you have done recently, L? In terms of? Life, just amazing. This is 80s wow. radical. Look at the shirt. Stay radical. Nice. I this love it. Well, we're, like, in, we're in California. I, we, we use the word rad regularly. I know. That's why. <laughs> <Almost, laughs> like, so rad. Um, I remember when I first got here uh, to California like 26 years ago, and someone was like, oh man, I got this gnarly cold. And I was like, gnarly? What's going on here? I love the, the, the surf terms. Um, well, you know what? I just think, um, well, self-publishing my second book. Awesome. Um, so Primal Blueprint Publishing, Mark Sisson, who published my first book, they're not doing any more new titles. So they're just uh -huh. publishing what they already have. And, you know, I said, let me do it myself. And I'm branching out into another topic of self-health, talking about confidence instead of just health. Um, you know, and I think that's, uh, that's kind of radical. Uh, I kind of did that on my own with the help of a fellow editor. So that was really fun. Amazing. And you know, other than that, a lot of rad hiking. California winters are amazing. I've gone on some amazing like nine mile, 10 mile hikes recently. I love being in nature and I think that is super rad. Um, and I, because of you and other people as well in the carnivore community, I, I, kind of love, I did an experiment there. I love it, but I've also gotten so much more organ meat in my life. And I love, uh, I'm, I'm making an extra effort to do like marrow bones and taking the gook out and putting it on top of a ribeye and eating, you know, grass fed beef liver and, and, and definitely moving more in that direction. So as far as health and, you know, paleo primal, I feel like I can keep getting a little bit cleaner, a little bit lower carb, and then introducing way more organ meat. So thanks to all of you guys for kind of lighting the fire there to remind us, you know, cause it's like, we knew it, but it's like, oh yeah, you know, I don't really think about buying liver. I should look into that. And now they've got, you know, at grass fed beef marrow bones places. And it's just, yeah, I love that stuff. So just kind of get into some radical cooking with the, with the primal stuff. Have you ever been to Bel Campo? You're in Malibu. Have you ever been to any of the Bel Campos? I keep hearing about it and I'm going to have to go because when Take I see it. the post, I'm like, oh my God, I got to go. It's so there. good. It's so good. They've got a bunch of stuff. And where is it? It's in, they've got like four or five locations in LA, Santa Monica, Hollywood, some other spots. Okay. Uh, San Francisco, New York. It's just, it's great. It's a regenerative farm in Northern California. It's an amazing spot and they have restaurants. Um, hopefully White Oak will get a White Oak restaurant other places in the U S too. But you know, what's interesting. Um, and then we'll wrap up is that I ended up self-publishing my book too. So I was working with a publisher 
and it just didn't really it just didn't really work out the way I wanted it to. So um, people who are holding my book or reading my book now may realize that um, the pre-orders of my book went out with a publisher, and then I just decided that I wanted to self-publish the whole thing. So there's actually there's a couple of versions of my book out there. There's the there's the first edition, which is the pre-order from the publisher, but the majority of books out there are are a self-published thing that I did and. Um, that was a I'm so glad thing. you did that. I'm yeah. so glad you did that. Yeah. That's, and that's taking a risk on oneself. And here's why for the people that don't know out there that are in the publishing world. So publishers usually get 80 to 90% of what you do. But what the thing, the problem is, is back in the old day, they might've promoted your book and done a great job at selling it. But then you have kind of book by, by committee sometimes. Now this didn't happen with me and Mark because they let me write the book I want, but that often doesn't happen. So you've got someone over your shoulder, not only telling you what kind of book you can write and what they disagree with. So that kind of sucks as a writer, but then only that they're taking 80 to 90% and you're doing all of the press. So obviously look at Paul, he's out there, he's on interviews, he has his own podcast. So it makes total sense. Same for me that I would self publish a book. That's not to say a publisher can't come around and offer you a deal, but it'll be a different deal because you've already gotten out there. And there's just so much more control over the information and what you decide to put out and the way you put it out there. So this is a bold move and I love it. And that's not to say you might not get another uh, situation with a publisher down the road that would look pretty to you. But, but for right now, I'm really glad you just did it on your own. It'll be interesting. I, who knows? You know, and I'll also highlight this and then we'll wrap up the podcast. There is an old boys network with publishers. If you do not publish with one of the big five, um, you cannot get on the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal bestseller list. So um, I think that many of your books would have made it onto the New York Times bestseller list. Hopefully my book would have made it onto the New York Times bestseller list, but there'll be Amazon bestsellers, but they, they will sell an equivalent or a greater number of copies than books that are on the New York Times or Wall Street Journal bestsellers, but you cannot get it onto that list if you are self-publishing. So people, if people are wondering, you know, like what the um, difference so is. That's really interesting because so, so for example, if people are, so Mark's been writing a book for years. He self-published The Primal Blueprint, which was his original tome and, and his famous book. Um, and he self-published that. It should have also made the New York Times bestseller list at some point, and it didn't. The only time Mark made the New York Times bestseller list is when he went to a big five publisher for Keto Reset and instantly became a New York Times bestseller. It just shows you the BS algorithms and what they do with the New York Times selling books. And then you've heard about certain people being like, okay, uh, like, hey, Paul, we'll try to get you on the New York Times list. I'm going to go buy 100,000 uh, know, of your book. Now they catch this and anyone can look it up. It's very interesting. We don't know for sure, but there is an interesting way that they decide who becomes New York Times bestseller. But at the end of the day, yeah, you're right. Unless you're picked up and you could be picked up by a top five to be become a New York Times bestselling author, but essentially sometimes the same number of books are sold, if not more, from the person that's the, not the New York Times, like considering Mark's Primal Blueprint an original book, like exactly. it's probably sold more than a lot of New York Times bestselling books. And ultimately it's just about getting the information out there to people. I, I, I mean, ego is challenging for me too. Of course, I'd like to be able to say New York Times bestseller. We all would. But, right? <laughs> but it's just like, you know what? We're just trying to get the information out there to people. That's what we're doing. All right, you guys, thanks for tuning in. Stay radical. Thank you so much, Al. Thank you. All right, all right, all right, you radical people. Like I said at the beginning of this uh, recording, The Carnivore Code is live. My book is out, and it is making a splash. It is an Amazon bestseller. It was, it's, continues to be an Amazon bestseller. It is doing really well. I worked really hard on it, and I'm so happy and proud and full of all the good, warm feelings that you guys are enjoying it. The reviews look great, um, and, and that's fantastic. I think when you write a book, you never know how it's going to be received. You always think, did I write a good book? Did I write a good book? And I think I wrote a good book, you guys. I put in over 600 references. You can find a table of contents listed at my website under the media tab. There's a tab for my book. My website is, of course, carnivoremd.com. Hopefully you guys all know that. Please leave me a review for the book on Amazon if you've gotten it. It's available on Kindle. It's also available on ebook on Nook and Kobo in Canada and also iBooks through Apple. The audiobook is coming in about three weeks. Stay tuned. It is in this voice that you are all so used to hearing and maybe like. I guess you're listening to this podcast. Maybe you like my voice. Anyway, that is the main thing that is going on with me. I am doing sort of a book promotion tour this next month or so. I've got a number of media appearances lined up, some super exciting ones that I can't divulge just yet. They are super secret, but they are going to be big, you guys. They are going to be big, and they are going to move this book along in a big way. So share it with your friends and family if you find it valuable. Um, please leave this podcast a review on iTunes if you can. It helps me 
move the message forward as well. And check out my website, carnivoremd.com, where you can sign up to be a fundamental health insider. The insiders were the first people to know about pre orders. They were the first people to know about the ebooks. They were the first people to know about my t shirts. Insiders are the first people to know about everything. You can get on that list at my website, which is carnivoremd.com, and you can get a free carnivore pyramid, which I'm just giving away to you guys to help you understand how to eat a carnivore diet. All those diagrams are also in my book, The Carnivore Code. Check it out now, www.thecarnivorecodebook.com. I love and appreciate you all so much. Thank you to my sponsors, Belcampo, White Oak Pastures, Regenerative Agriculture is the Future. I can't even tell you how good I feel about supporting these farms. Uh, It's amazing. And Ancestral Supplements. And this week, thanks for checking out Future. And let me know what you think of that app on your Apple Watch. All right, you guys, on to the next one. See you next week in the podcast. Let me know what you think of this one with Al Russ. I love you all. Bye.